So I, I'm Sincere, and um, I'm working on uh, speeding up kernel builds with automated header refactoring. So build times are held back significantly by lexing and parsing needless tokens. So when you import something that's unnecessary, you're slowing down your build time. And headers tend to grow over time, so this can become problematic very easily. So one of the goals uh, we want to do is we want to make it easier to refactor headers because uh, for something like the Linux kernel that's moving fast, it's really painful to just remove a header um, because someone else might write some code that depends on it. And there's also a lot of tooling that's missing, and we want to sort of fill in that gap. So if you see uh, this, this is sort of a diagnosis of what's taking up the most time, right? Uh, you'll see most of the time is spent uh, lexing and parsing. Um, and there's a little bit of semantic analysis and code generation here, but um, most of the time is just dominated by, lexer, by the lexer and parser. And this is sort of an issue, right? So when we pre-process the files, uh, they become hundreds of times larger. Um, and that means we'll have millions of extra lines to parse, which is not really great. And it puts a lot of load on the uh, lecture and parser. And it also like bleeds into the other parts of, of the compilation pipeline. And at least a bigger compiler IR and a lot of other stuff. So the, the compiler front end doesn't like sufficiently address the pre-processing bloat. So we want to sort of prevent it from ever like reaching that stage by removing some headers or refactoring some headers. So the motivation for this is uh, Engel Molnar has been reworking the headers of the Linux kernel to build faster. And uh, in some configurations for specific x86 builds, he's gone 50 to 80% improvements in build times, which is great. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, the status of these commits are sort of up in the air um, and it's unclear what, uh, it's unclear like how he's, how to automate this. So we want to step in and sort of help with that. And um, that's what this project is going to do because we want it to like, this is a one-off series of changes and we want this to stop being a problem like permanently. So what are the additional be benefits just beyond build times? There's also a reduction in times to bisect and a reduction in times uh, to uh, perform reductions, right? So the tool we're using is called include what you use. It's a tool tr traditionally used for C++, but we're using this on the kernel. So it can make indirect includes direct, and it can also remove dead includes. So because the Linux kernel is uh, pretty large and organized, it's relatively easy to use it on the kernel. And uh, there are some problems with uh, include what you use them. The problems lie in the fact that not all headers are configure, uh, not all he headers work with all configurations. And the include what you use defaults are sort of like mm -hmm. prohibitive, sort of like prevent us from using it out of the box for the Linux kernel. So we have to work around it. So some problems with uh, include what you use, type defs like in 6014, they're commonly defined in uh, standard int uh, and the Linux kernel doesn't have a standard int. So when we use include what you use, it recommends that we include a header that doesn't exist and that's problematic. And the reason for that is that it has defaults and these defaults can be changed. So that's something we need to do when using what you use. Um, so these uh, are accelerator tables and they just map commonly used symbols like in 64 t to standard int .h. So we can actually fix this and make our own include what you use faster by mapping in 64 t to uh, types.h instead. And yeah, so beyond that, there's another problem where if you use a dash i, which the kernel uses very frequently, it converts uh, angle brackets to quotation marks, which is just a stylistic change that's not very good. So one of the problems we run into is um, asm versus asm generic. When we convert all includes 
uh, all indirect includes to direct includes. That means we pull in ASM generics. And uh, generally, you can have ASM generic string 64T, which is like, it, it won't work with ARM, for example. So instead, what we can do is we can tell include what you use. If you're going to pull in this header, uh, don't. Uh, just pull in this secondary header instead. So if uh, string pulls in string 64.T, it, it, we'll just say, just pull in string and stop at, at that. And this can be sort of done uh, programmatically if we uh, if we uh, use uh, k-build uh, or arch k-build. And this is something we're still experimenting with. So another problem with include what you use is macros. Uh, include what you use is notoriously pretty bad with macros. Um, and it doesn't know when macros are called, so it sometimes just rips them out entirely. Uh, that's not great because the Linux kernel uses macros all the time. And um, another problem is sometimes the kernel declares duplicate headers. Uh, that is intentional, and it gets removed by include what you use. Uh, this is called an extra macro. Um, and dealing with these sort of requires some manual effort, but it can be assisted in one way, which is including... Uh, include what you use pragmas. This is what is traditionally used. Uh, maybe we don't want to use this in the kernel though. So that that's, uh, we, we've come up with ways to avoid that. And another thing is token pacing identifiers makes analysis tricky. So how are we going to deal with the fact that it sometimes just rips out macros and it deduplicates headers? Um, well, just as they have inclusion inclusion tables, they also have symbol tables. So the purpose of a symbol table is to say, if you have this specific symbol, you're going to call this specific header. And this has made it so that whenever we see a macro, uh, it doesn't rip it out entirely. And that's great because it allows us to sort of fix more files. Because if we didn't have this, we would sort of have to just skip over files that have macros because more often than not, they just get removed entirely. Uh, the problem with this is that it's slightly time consuming to create and they need to be kept in sync with the kernel version. Uh, for example, if you move something out of a symbol table or if you move something out of a header or have it uh, multiple times, it could be pro uh, problematic. Uh, so that is a concern with this. Uh, but some statistics, because we have run this and it has worked for the most part. So for string.o, for example, um, libstring.o, uh, when we pre-process it without our header changes, it has 24,000 lines of code. And after pre-processing it, it has 5,000 lines of code. Sorry, that's after running include what you use. Oh, and yeah. Then after running it. include what you use and then pre-processing it, it has 78% uh, less stuff. So... Before uh, include what you use, build time is 0.36 seconds. After include what you use, it's 0.12 seconds. And this is like a very significant speed up. Um, this isn't, this is like a pretty large speed up compared to some other files. Some other files will cut down in, by a smaller amounts, but this is still a significant speed up. And when using an automated include what you use script, uh, what we found is uh, it didn't change anything except for a warn on, which is which was it just said there was a warning on this line number. The line number just changed because there were fewer headers, uh, so the line moved up. So uh, our progress so far, uh, th these numbers are for a machine with 128 cores uh, and an x86 def config. Uh, the def config all build takes roughly 72.3 seconds. Uh, after changes to around 220 files, we, we only looked at 300 and we managed to change to 20 automatically. Um, we managed to get down to exactly 69 seconds and there's 2,700 files. So we've looked at roughly one ninth of it. So there's definitely a lot more of a speed up to be obtained. And this is also only for one, uh, conf for one uh, configuration. So there's still a lot of stuff to remove. And, um, Overall, we've removed over a million lines of uh, code from pre-processing. So another thing we've looked into is pre-compiled headers. So these can speed up build times and they're used pretty frequently in C++. And 
uh, what we want to do is we want to uh, use this on the most frequently included um, headers. So some candidates are compiler types.h, kconfig.h, and compiler version.h. These are used all the time. And these are forcibly injected into every translation unit using a dash include if you analyze compile commands.json. Um, so yeah, problem we run into sort of when including uh, PCH uh, pre-compiled headers uh, is there's it's sensitive to um, the flags. It's very sensitive to the flags. And there are often headers that are used in both the host utilities and the um, target machine. So what happens is you're going to have to delete the header or create two versions of the pre-compiled header because once you create it once, you're going to have to recompile the host utilities um, or you're going to have the, the next time you uh, build, you're going to have to rebuild the host utilities. So that is a concern. So we're uh, currently seeing if it's worth doing and what the potential speed ups would be. And as for future research, uh, we're trying to automatically break up headers because before we were changing the include list of C files, which is good and it can provide changes. Um, and it has provided changes, but the origin of the issues are really in the headers. Uh, let, let's imagine everything was in just one giant header. That would be pretty problematic, right? There's no way to change that easily with include what you use. So um, we can do, we can fix this with sort of static analysis um, and sort of given an identifier, what are the uses, right? So what we have done is we can, for a specific header, we can construct a fully connected graph and uh, the weights in between each ed in between a no two nodes would be how frequently they appear in the same file across configuration. And from this, we can use a graph partitioning algorithm here. We used hierarchical agglomeration. So we can just essentially break the fully connected uh, graph into two parts. Um, here, uh, you can see that most of the um, tokens that we uh, put into the green side are um, integers. So this might suggest that we want to break up types.h into a uh, standard int.h as well. And uh, Nick can handle this. Sure. Uh, yeah. So. Um, there's some other things beyond just automated header refactoring around kind of trying to speed up the build further. So right now, Tanzir is doing research and just seeing like, can we apply include what you use to make indirect includes direct and dead includes removed? Um, can we use pre-compiled headers either for frequently reused headers or headers that get included often? Um, and then finally, how can we decide where to split headers? Um, so from there, the additional things that we kind of need. Um, so we have some tooling for LLVM that lets us, like given a compiler IR file and a symbol, that's usually a function, it will extract. Um, so if you have compiler IR, that's like a, a million lines of code. And you say, I just want this function definition. Pull this out, please. It can pull out just that function definition for you. And then you can say like recursively pull out the definitions of the things it calls. Um, we don't have anything like that for C. And that would be nice because when I decide, like we have some policy first of where we're gonna make like split a header, we don't have any tooling to say like given this .h file, create a second .h file for me and copy over the definition. Like that that would be nice to try to automate some stuff. Um, and then some other things going on, there's a lot of work going on right now in the kbuild tree around mod post and improving build times because that's a pretty large serialization step in the build. And so for instance, there was like a commit within the latest release I think that just got merged into 6.7, um, but it actually shaves minutes off of all yes config builds. Uh, I think there's more to be done there because I still think it's single threaded and I think maybe we can start to add some parallelism to mod posts, I don't know. Um, but really kind of the, the feedback we're looking from folks here at Plumbers today is what else do we need to build? And so like a common thing that we've had as well is, or heard from kernel developers is that we have some issues with some headers or some types, I guess, where in order to reference the type properly, like this header needs, like two headers need to be included in a certain order or vice versa. 
kind of thing. Um, so we're kind of curious what other thoughts folks have, because I don't think this problem is very spe specific to the kernel, but in general, C doesn't have a whole lot of tooling for this. Maybe I'm unaware of something though, but do folks have ideas? So I build the perf tool a lot. And uh, an obscure thing in the perf tool is that we have the, um, the include Linux stuff is copied into the tools directory, as is the UAPI stuff. But the Linux stuff comes first on the dash, dash I uh, things before the UAPI one. So what that means is that Linux types.h has got priority over the UAPI types.h, which is kind of weird for a user mode program. Uh, and we run into all kinds of conflicts because, you know, you you include like something from the Linux types.h, and then you include stud.io.h, which somewhere down there gets into an asm generic types.h. Um, why is everything called types.h? So it's a, <laughs> we have core.c and types.h. We have two file names, and we'll use them everywhere. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's. <clears throat> I, I, I feel like we sometimes we're our own worst enemy and kind of like by naming every file the same name, it's like, but why? Um, but Was there a re request in there, Ian? Yeah, yeah, can we rename things and not, not call everything types.h? Yeah, so I think like part of the issue with renaming stuff is just like you can, you can be certain that at this point in time for my tree right now, it builds and then someone's pull request beats you to Linus where they depend on the thing that you just renamed, and oops, and that's that's going to be tricky no matter what for this problem. So, from my understanding here of include what you use, it's automatically telling you what to include and so on. I think one of the big problems I've looked at uh, because reviewing Ingo's thing that was mentioned before is that we have a few places that are just super connected nodes like kernel .h and shed .h, just including tons that has tons of fan out fan in, and it's used everywhere, so there's tons of fan out. So having some tooling to analyze that fan in and fan out would be really helpful for saying, actually, this header gets included everywhere, or it's including everything, regardless of how you want to partition it. Knowing what that scaling factor is on either side gives you a good idea of, if we cut that, what the benefit would be. So that, that would be really nice. Yeah, so one of the things we did was, uh, so we have hierarchical agglomeration. So basically what it does is it goes to a specific header and it ch checks basically what's the impact of each token, right? So if it's included everywhere, we're gonna see that in this. Uh, sure, I'm, I'm just asking for a different oh, granularity. I can distinguish. So I think um, just expanding on Mark's point, so like this is taking a look at one .h file at a time and deciding like, okay, we've, I but Mark's question is how do you identify which .h files you look at first? And, and so Arnd has, I think Arnd has shown tooling where he's able to generate graphs of that fan in, fan out. And so I think that's something where we can look at to see how strongly connected is this node. Okay, now that we've identified which .h file we're gonna start with breaking up, then you move on to this, which decides how do I split it? And you, you basically, basically this technique is using correlation between of all the symbols in the header, um, who's using them. Sure, I, I guess from my perspective, I'm not sure this is like, I'm not sure that this is necessarily the the level of detail we actually want to analyze this with, because you can certainly do analysis with this. But for most things, the fan out and the fan in, I think are gonna dominate. And also like one of the big reasons we have unnecessary fan in and fan out is headers that mix like structure definitions and code. Because we've got, because that, that's the big problem with kernel.h and shed.h, right? Shed.h pulls in absolutely everything because it needs to put a bunch of structures in task struct. And while including all of those headers for those like structs that it's embedding, it also goes and pulls in function definitions. That ends up pulling in other files and so on. Whereas like, if we have, oh, sorry, static and like, whereas if we had, for example, um, an idiom where we said, when you have thing, you have a foo types.h and a foo.h, and your foo types.h should have the bare minimum includes necessary to put this structure in something. Actually, I suspect that would have a big benefit and that would, I wouldn't necessarily get all the benefit of what Ingo has on in history, but I suspect it would get a quite substantial portion of that quite easily. And then if we had the ability to analyze the fan in and fan out, it would make it much easier to say, we should definitely do that to this thing over here. And I suspect we could get very close very quickly without having to go into this level of fine granularity. And therefore that would be an easier thing to tell people to do. 
No other points, Andrew? Um, mainly as the, so the thing is that the, um, the, fu the function declarations themselves are, are fine. It's the static inlines that have full code in them that are far more expensive. They're also the ones that tend to make it quite complicated to refactor headers because they're just regular bits of C. You've got to have all, you've got to have the internals of the structures and all the functions uh, done ahead of that. So even splitting static inlines out into somewhere else um, would uh, fi figuring out how to move those sideways again would make a lot of flexibility improvements. Is is forward declaration evil in this world view? Um, I don't think so. I think I think we. There's, there's an option to allow forward declaration and to not allow forward declaration. We've, we've turned on the option that allows forward declaration because we don't want to like fundamentally change too many people's code. So, yeah. Guessing the previous talk on ABI analysis had a point on opaque types. Maybe they would frown upon it. Unclear yet. Haven't sent patches yet. So until we do and someone says, no, no, I don't like this. Then we'll maybe be forced to have that discussion, but we haven't been forced to have that discussion quite yet, I think. <laughs> sure. Um, is there any talk to adding any of these checks in mainline kernel? I mean, you don't necessarily need to add like your full tooling, but yeah. you know, something that maintainers or someone who's writing more code can say, oh, you know, there's some low hanging fruit that we can take care of before pushing. Yeah, so the, the end goal would be to have this maybe not in mainline or maybe even in mainline, but we want this to be a tool that not just us, but other developers can use to sort of analyze this uh, and on their own and prevent any problems. Yeah. Right. Covered by something you said earlier, but in a few places we have like definitions in one header, and there are comments at the top saying, "Absolutely, do not include this header. Include this other header that wraps it." Yeah. Um, do we have the right annotations to be able to handle that with this tool? Yeah. So there, basically, the way we can deal with this, um, I ran into this a few times. So the way you can deal with this is using the inclusion tables and saying, if you're about to include this one stop and include the other thing instead. Um, that has worked for the most part. So we haven't run into that issue. Yeah. Cool. All right. If that's no more questions, I don't want to block uh, fo hungry folks heading to lunch. So let's give Tanzir a round of applause.